in our practice. We're, we're going day by day, month to month, hoping it gets better. Whereas you need a plan. You need What does it look like in a year's time, in two years' time? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Ray Brown. So Ray has journeyed from the bustling streets of Scotland to the sun-kissed shores of Australia, where he now resides with his family in the fine city of Melbourne. He's been there since 2005. Ray's prowess extends beyond mere business ventures. He's a seasoned business coach. He's guided startups, major financial institutions, tech enterprises, and esteemed executives alike. At the moment, he occupies the helm of no fewer than six company boards within Australia, in addition to three esteemed international architectural firms. It's within the realm of architectural business mentorship that we're really interested in where I think Ray truly shines. Um, he recognized a glaring void, very much like we did at Business of Architecture, with the business acumen of architects. And he set up a organization co-founded called Archibiz, which is an initiative uh, providing bespoke business education tailored exclusively for architectural practitioners. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Through Archibiz, Ray endeavors to empower ambitious architects to navigate through the intricate intersection of commerce and design, fostering enterprises that are both financially robust and creatively fulfilling. And Ray is about to launch a new initiative called their Business Foundations Programs. They've been doing a uh, consulting practice previously, and now they have created a, uh, a full architectural business curriculum aimed at uh, architecture firm owners to give a real solid grounding for running a successful and profitable practice. So I was very excited to talk to Ray about this. We talked about the sorts of issues that we often see architects dealing with in their business, some of the mindset that's often gets in the way and makes running a business more challenging in architecture. And we talk about profit, making money, financial optics, and all of the things that are included in the architecture uh, business Foundations program from Archibiz. If you want to find out more about Archibiz, I'd recommend that you uh, check out the info in this podcast where all the details are and you can go on and have a look and sit back, relax and enjoy the brilliant Ray Brown. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Ray, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm exceptionally well. I'm exceptionally well. It's um, 11 o'clock at night here, but um, still bright and breezy and ready to go. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Always a pleasure to, to speak with you. Now, you're a business mentor, the co-founder of Archibiz. Um, you're based all the way on the other side of the world in, um, where is it? You're in Australia. Yeah, in, in Melbourne, that's true. In Melbourne, yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, and you you guys have been doing some very interesting and very important work in the architecture industry. You've been serving clients very, very much in the same vein that we do here in Business of Architecture, um, helping architecture practices become more profitable, help them develop their pipelines, help them get the kind of financial eyes on what's happening inside the business so they're not running blind or by the you know you know um just by the what's the phrase by the seats of their pants type of thing. Of their pants, yes yes um, exactly. and, and and that kind of you know the overwhelm and the panic that often ensues in an architecture practice you guys have been developing a very complete and holistic program to help architects you know move out of those problems and we're going to talk a little bit about that today and some of the innovations that you guys have been um developing but what, let's start with um how can we just talk a little bit about yourself actually and i know we've had you on the podcast before um when we spoke about this but i think it's really interesting because your access into the architecture industry is is quite unique um how did you come to 
be doing what you're doing now? Yeah, well, I had a long business career. I started off in South Africa, actually, in corporate, and then had a series of businesses in the UK. Uh, I came to Australia in 2005 with my family, and I joined a business coaching company there, and they taught me the, the sort of ropes around coaching teams and, and um, individuals. So I've coached lots of companies, probably for the last almost 20 years. Um, and But for the last five years, we've focused on architects. And the reason for that was we had a couple of architect clients. They seemed like really nice people. They were very receptive. And I think the biggest um, thing for me was that they were um, acknowledging that there was a gap for them. We don't mm. get taught anything about business at, at university. They realized there was a gap there, but... but Really, there's, there hasn't been a, a sort of holistic approach to how, how you fill that gap. Um, my original plan was to uh, get something online that we could sell in, in big quantities so that I could go and line a beach and drink pina colada. <laughs> that, that, that didn't quite work out. And we built a really very successful consultancy business, a bit like business of architecture. So mm-hmm. we've got a, a what we call the, the principles of business success. And we've been teaching people that over the last five years. Alongside that, we had a, a program called Designing Architectural Practice Success. Now, this is a lesson for all architects. You've got to get the name right. You've got to understand, get something that's easy to explain to people. Mm-hmm. We, call, we called it internally DAP. And so until you explained that to someone, it was really, really hard and, and hard to market. So we've undergone a bit of change. We, we're going to pivot as a business. I'm going to go from a consultancy with a little bit of training online a mm-hmm. fully fledged education company, and right. we're looking at the what we call the foundational, the business foundations, the fundamental business education. That's what we're looking to provide, and I think that's the that's the gateway to people developing the practice. It doesn't give all the answers, mm-hmm. but it at least conceptually starts the process. Got yeah. So what sorts of things, and this, and this is always an interesting conversation to, to be looking at, what, what kinds of issues do you see architecture practices typically dealing with? Um, well, I think the, the, the initial thing is the narrative in architecture. That we see that as our, our biggest competition, really, because mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a story in architect, architects love speaking to one another and they love, it's a little bit woe is me, and life is hard, and things are getting the, more the difficult. The architect blues, I call it. <laughs> yeah, the architect blues, exactly. And and it's, it's very um, toxic because it, it, it doesn't paint a picture of a, an upside or if we get this right, we could really do well. Mm-hmm. And we, we know, and you know, that, that we can take architectural practices that are bouncing along, breaking even, making a little bit of profit, and with that, not a huge amount of change across the range of aspects of business, you can bring that same business into into profit. And it's not mm-hmm. about huge changes in the business. It's not about lots of more work, typically. And sometimes more work is not the answer to the problem. Yeah. Uh, more work can put that on top of a, a badly run or an inefficient practice, and that can actually make things worse. Mm-hmm. So it's... it's it's a bit like the uh, Atomic Habits book. It's it's the aggregation of incremental change, mm-hmm. uh, little bits, little bits. And we we speak about um, you know rhythm is really important. So getting a a business rhythm into into the practice so that you're not. So quite often, what we find, and I'm sure you find the same, that most practices are driven by two things: they're driven by the work and the clients. So the clients on the phone and the work deadlines, and the kind of needs of the business. Tend to, tend to get forgotten mm-hmm. um, or put in the background or something. When we've got a minute, we'll have a look at the numbers or whatever. And we meet so many, account, uh, so many architects that tell us they wait till the end of the year for their accountant to tell them how they've been doing. And, I mean, that, that, there's just no way to run a business. Yeah, no, that's, that's very common. And we'll, we'll hear, I mean, I'm often very surprised at how little people are looking at money at all in the business and you, you, you it's interesting you were saying about kind of the, some of the toxic culture that exists and this I find um, it's so sort of deep rooted in the industry where the whole conversation around money is very unhealthy I mean I often recall the story of you know when I was in my first year of becoming an architect and the tutor lines us all up and says right there's going to be you know there's 120 of us and there's going to be maybe 30 of you that actually become architects and once you become an architect you're never going to make any money 
And the real reason why you're here is because you're doing it as a vocation. You're doing it out of the love for doing it. It was kind of like pledging allegiance to this lifelong um, quest of, you know, of of um, not allowing yourself to have any money in service of the higher art form of architecture. Um, yeah, no, I, and, and I've, I have a similar story. I was on a panel about five years ago with one of my clients at a conference. The, the topic, the, the theme of the conference was the business of architecture, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, there were 300 people in the audience, most of them small businesses, most of them struggling, I suspect. And I was telling the, the upside story of one of our clients, and she was giving her experience. And there was a grey-haired guy in the panel, a bit like me, took the, the microphone and said, look, what you people have got to realise is that we're not a business, we're not an industry, we're a profession. And, and I just really, that, that, that situation has just gone through my mind over and over again because it's so, it's so disruptive and mm -hmm. so um, it's just not helpful to think like that. So, so one of the things we say right up front in our first module is it's good business that produces the foundation to allow you to do good architecture, not yes. the other way around. Good architecture yeah. doesn't lead to good business. And, and yes. we meet so many architects that have done some really good work, they've won some awards, and then they're sitting by the telephone waiting for the phone to ring and saying, I wonder why it's not ringing, because we're a really mm -hmm. good architect. And that, that is the, it's the problem in many industries, that people are passionate about the product, mm -hmm. and the process of selling that product and marketing that product is, is given, you know, it's just not given enough attention. Yeah, no, it's it's very deeply interwoven into the architectural culture of being anti-business, if you like, or very suspicious of business. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you know about the AIA and the ROBA in the past. It was actually, you know, it was it was in breach of the code of conduct um, to be marketing or advertising your your services. And yeah. so that that kind of culture kind of still persists of like it's well, it's ungentlemanly to actually be going out and finding work or advertising. And, and even amongst architects, I mean, I, I'm going to often say this to our clients that if another architect says, describes another architect as being a good a marketeer, it's an insult. Yeah. It's norm it's, it, it's, it's normally, it normally means, yeah, but they're, they're good at marketing, meaning that their work has no substance or they're, doing, they're cheating. It's, it's yeah. literally like yeah. that. It's, 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 a cult. Yeah. it's like they're cheating, which is baffling. Yeah, no, I had a call this morning with uh, Tyler Somola in, in the States, and uh, he's doing such great work online and helping people just bring some of these concepts and um, issues to, to the fore. And we were speaking about sales, and, and he had exactly the same sort of construction as I have around that, that every sale begins with a problem. So mm -hmm. You've got to understand someone's problem. And, and you've got to convince someone that your solution is better than everybody else to solve that problem. And say, sales then become the, the bridge between somebody's problem and your solution. It's no more than that. So it's nothing sleazy. Sales is not sleazy. It's simply a bridge between somebody's problem and your solution. And, and the better you build that bridge, the better relationship you'll have with the client, the better work you'll get, uh, and the more you'll be able to charge. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and you can approach the marketing and selling as, you know, this is my, this is me helping, you know, yeah. when you're making calls or phone calls to people that you've never met before, it's not desperate. That's the other thing I'll often hear. Um, architects say, they'll be like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be reaching out. I don't want to be um, contacting people I've never met before because I'm just going to come across as desperate as opposed to a mindset of, you know, you, you, you're reaching out to help somebody and there's going to be a, you're going to be able to give them something of 10 times more value than what they're going to pay pay you for and you're going to be able to charge a, a premium fee for it it's um yeah and i think that it's a choice i, I hmm. absolutely see it as a choice do you want to be that struggling person that has worked long hours and gets paid less than you could get paid working for mm -hmm. someone down the road that that to me it baffles me when, when right in front of you is an opportunity to step ahead of the pack or, or differentiate yourself, whatever way you want to put it. Um, if you, You've got to be a good architect in the first instance, but most of the people we deal with are great architects. They're yeah. passionate about what they're doing. And, and I think because of the people that reach out to the likes of you and the likes of us, um, they're realising that there's more to this process than just good architecture. Um, and once they make that realisation, then 
it's a it's an amazing breakthrough. Okay, and and profit is there to be got. We, we meet a lot of practices. And we'll say to them, "Are you making profit?" Oh, we make a lot of profit. We make hundred thousand or hundred fifty or whatever. Uh, and is that after a salary you pay yourself? Oh, oh no, we take our salary out of that. that <laughs> so it's not really a profit. It's actually an income, and there's not much left after a decent income in some of the numbers that we come up against. Yes. Yeah. No. I uh, uh, and and you know. This is quite important because I think the idea of what profit actually is, is is mysterious in the industry. I've had the exact same conversation with people. I was speaking to somebody um, a few weeks back and I was asking them, okay, what's the profit in your, in your business? And they were like, 50%. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's, that's ama- and tell, tell me more about the 50%. And then it turns out that it wasn't 50%. It was 50% after they paid their consultants. And I was like, well, hold on a minute. That's not, that's not profit. That's, <laughs> no, that's, that's money that you've got to run your business with, basically, and, and pay your salary out of. And then yeah. it turned out, you know, and then we start looking at it more. And it was, it was like, oh, well, actually, we're making a loss. And that, yeah. was, that was pretty shocking, actually, yeah. to, to have that kind of conversation and the kind of casualness of thinking that it was 50% profit and being happy with it, and then realizing with a bit of direction, actually we're making a loss. Yeah. Um, well, I, and... I could, I'll be quite controversial now, and I've spent my business life fighting with accountants. Mm-hmm. And the main reason for that is accountants hold themselves up as advisors, and the, the business people, not just architects, they kind of look to the accountant for that guidance. Mm-hmm. And accountants are just not good at it. They're not good at mm-hmm. the advice it takes. They're not good at looking forward. They're good at counting the numbers. And to some extent, they're not, they're not good marketing people because they, they have a service that the government says you need an, an accountant. You, know, you must go and get yourself an accountant. So they don't really need to do that much in terms of marketing. And they, I actually work with an accounting practice. And when you come out of the left, they've got a, a sign on the wall that says, there's a sort of saying in the day, of the day. And if you... A couple of months ago, they put up a sign that said, most of our successful clients have got a budget. Have you got one? Mm-hmm. And I thought, what a dreadful thing for an accountant to put on a board. Why, why is every business that they advise not got a budget? Um, but, but quite often, it's a situation where uh, well into the new financial year, mm-hmm. the accountant is coming along and saying, let's go through your numbers and let's look at um, how you did last year. And that that bit that you spoke about that we would call margin, the difference between the selling price and the cost price, mm-hmm. um, that, that's very different from profit. And mm-hmm. yet, I still looked at a set of accounts today for one of my businesses, and the new accountant had that in profit at that line there. That's nothing to do with profit. That's, mm-hmm. that's margin that goes then, as you say, to pay the rent and the, the electricity and the marketing and the running of the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting. So. Let's talk a little bit about what's possible for an architecture business when yep. it's got decent systems in place, when it's got a little bit of business acumen, when there's a kind of um, perspective that's been created where they're engaged with the business. What sorts of things do you see or turnarounds do you see with businesses? You know, the target that we give to most of our clients is 15 to 20% net profit. That's mm-hmm. Net profit after a market rate salary for the the owners working within the business. Um, and we've got people obviously doing less than that and people go through difficult times and they might have a couple of months of losses, but at least they see that coming and at least they've got some tactics to, to um, counteract that. At the other end, we've got clients who are making 30% net. Now, in an, in a, unless you're a, some sort of star architect uh, getting really high fees, what we find is that 30% is probably not sustainable in a small practice of five right. or ten people. And, and as I said to this client, I said, you know, the, the rivets must be popping in your business at the moment if you're making 30%. And he came back and he said, well, how did you know? Because it, it, that's exactly where we are. We're, we're making lots of money, but we're very stressed and feeling overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And we're actually starting to let people down. So there's, there's this element of sustainability um, and what's possible in the market and that, that's driven by your efficiency and the, the fees that you charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there, are, there is a range that, that kind of makes sense in the business. And I would put it at the 15 to 20%. What do you find? Yeah, I mean, the, the good clients, if they're doing anything above 20%, is a big, a big thumbs up. 
And we do have the, uh, you know, depending on the, some of the markets, if th those practices working in the super luxury high end markets often can make 30% and above and yeah. they can charge. I mean, that, that's a very sort of niche market. And we're talking about those catering for the houses that are in the sort of $50 million kind of yeah. range that, that, that those businesses tend to have very, have higher profits. Yeah, sure. yeah, I was speaking to someone just in the last week who um, they build warehouses for Amazon, right? You know, and that, that sort of four hundred million dollar build, and they they're, they're making reasonable, very very good profit margins. Yeah, um, and, and then they've done consistently for a number of years. Yeah, and clients um, serving tech as well, so working with like you know Tesla or Rivian yeah. or those kinds of um, those sorts yeah. of companies can often. It, well, it's, I it, think that. I mean, that's, that's one of the basic um, things that we teach and, and you teach is, is around positioning. Mm -hmm. So we, we speak about um, you need to specialize, you need to systemize, and then you need to scale. Mm -hmm. um, and typically people do a little bit of systemization and then they scale and suddenly they've got 10 people. And what we find is we're constantly backfilling the system side of the process and, and trying mm -hmm. to get them into and, and it's this whole thing about working on your business, not in your business. It's a really neat thing to say, but who actually tells you how to work on your business? Mm -hmm. that, that's the missing piece, we think. That what does working on your business look like from a day-to-day, month-to-month basis? What am I looking at? How do, how do I? And it's not a, it shouldn't be a, an industry within your business to, to work on the business. It's, we, we work very much around a monthly board meeting, and that, that takes an hour, an hour and a half a month. We've got set reports and we've got set structure, finance, operations, sales and marketing, a little bit of strategy at the end if required. And that that rhythm is just so important that people get mm -hmm. used to where do you look, when do you look, how do you read the KPIs that, that tell you what the trends are in the business. And you get that you get that early warning on problems that are gonna arise. Um, and probably one of the key KPIs that we use is a six months rolling average of work secured. Okay, mm -hmm. How much work are you put? I know it's lumpy and sometimes you miss a month, you don't win any work. But if over a six month period, what's the average amount of work that you're picking up? And if you if you record that number each month, that number will tell you what the business looks like in six months. Yeah. Do you have enough work for the people or are you going to need more people? Or what is the business looking like out in front? Uh, and, and that that's a revelation to most architects. They, they just don't think like that at the moment. So, so what sorts of things do you typically find yourself addressing inside of the business? What kinds of systems do you help them get set up? What kinds of processes do you get them trained in? Yeah. So, so the, the, if I speak about the Business Foundations Programme, which is the, the new programme we're about to launch, mm -hmm. um, we start off with, with mindset. So it's strategic at the beginning. The bit about the narrative and abundance and um, it's good business leads to good architecture, not the other way around. We speak to about business cycle, you know, where are you in the business cycle? And, and quite often that's a good starting point because people realize they're not the only people feeling disillusioned or stressed. Uh, that's quite common in the industry and it's quite common in business, not just only in architecture. So that's reassuring right up front. Then we speak about vision and that's how do you do vision? People speak about it, but... What's the process of developing a vision? How do you how do you get to that? Uh, we speak about structure, uh, which is how do we separate the business from the individual? So quite often mm -hmm. a business gets identified with the individual leader, um, and that that's what we call a a they business or a he business or a she business. And the first thing is to try and get people to think like a we business. You know, where are we going? How are we developing? Um, and that that takes a lot of pressure off the the leader of the business, if, if that load is, is spread across the business. Yeah. Um, then, then we look at, uh, obviously, a, a bit on marketing. It's a very high-level positioning, getting them to, to put this marketing, where does it fit in? We, we speak a lot about what we call the tribe. So who is your tribe? Who, who you get? People say to you, so we get a lot of tire kickers on the, on the telephone. Well, that means that your marketing is not working. You're not attracting the right people. The wrong people, we use uh, the car industry as a, a really good analogy because um, if you need a showroom that matches your client base. You know, if, and you don't, there aren't many Suzuki buyers coming into a Rolls Royce showroom or vice versa because these are well positioned businesses that, that know where they sit in the market, um, know how 
the type of people they want, the service, the price, and the product all matches up. So the positioning works. So getting positioning right. And then sales, the mm -hmm. classic sales um, thing we speak about, which is your sales process? Oh, well. Yeah, or well, we get a, we have a briefing meeting. We go into a lot of detail on that, and then we spend two days on the uh, put a free proposal together. And then what do you do? Oh well, we email it to the client, you know. <laughs> and immediately, well, you're laughing, and, and I laugh, and you're going to go, "Gee, uh, it, it needs to be a two two meeting process." You do the, the briefing meeting, you prepare the proposal, and then you present that proposal. Um, and it, it's just. It, Defies logic that you would lose control of the sales process by emailing. <laughs> because we know what the client's going to do. They're going to go to the last page, see how much it is, and that could be the end of the story. And you have had no time to sell and convince. And, um, and we say to clients, you're selling two things, confidence and perceived value. And mm -hmm. if you don't take every opportunity to do that and learn how to do that and practice how to do that, then you're going to struggle. Well, it's, um, it's, it's so, it's funny, the um, learning to present just simply one of the first things I'll say with our clients is very similar sort of thing. You know, before we even go into learning a, a sales framework, which will, you know, a conversational framework and how you can lead the conversation, get into the habit of just presenting your proposals, just, you know, say that in all the podcasts, just present it face to face because there's so many things you can pick up on questions you can ask um objections you can handle and you can you can navigate the conversation into closing it right then and there as opposed to you know just sending it out and waiting and then getting into the chasing and then the client is now comparing your proposal to somebody else's proposal and now all they can tell the difference is just the price and you know it just you just you just let go of all of the control of the of the process there and it's very frustrating it's very yeah, frustrating well, for but, architects well, yeah and then i've a client say to me when do we follow up when do we phone the client and check in well if you haven't asked that question you definitely have lost control of the process yeah uh, and, and just again i was speaking to tyler today about um the close, you know, and how you, how you, people would hear that in the close, that sounds very salesy, but mm -hmm. at some point you've got to ask for the business. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn how to do that in a, in a way. And the, the two questions that we say to our clients that you need to, not in these words necessarily, and you can change them and put them into your tone, but say to the client, what criteria are you going to use to choose your architect? What's important to you in this process? Um, and not, don't assume that price is number one, because mm -hmm. quite often price is not number one. Um, so don't don't assume get the, the actual criteria the client's going to use. And then the second question is, what specifically do we need to do to get your business? How do we how do we we're really excited about your project? How do we get that? And now people recoil a little bit at maybe that form of words, but those two those two concepts you need to find a way to, to ask both of those questions of the client um, because that will. And then you can get your hit rate. Then you can decide, find out how many how many presentations you have to make to win one. Is it one mm -hmm. in three, one in two, one in five? Uh, and then that will that will inform your forecasting in the future, you know, and your marketing and the level of interest that you need to get. Um, so we do a module at the end on, on we leave finance actually to the second last module because it's mm -hmm. it's not it's complicated, but it's very new to people. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you do that up front, um, we, we do the kind of stuff that's a little bit more sexy and interesting at the beginning, and then we work our way up to the finance. Um, and then we do a final module, which is how do you implement all this stuff? Yeah. How do you, how do you take – really what, all we're presenting to people are concepts. We're not, we're not going into the knowledge and understanding piece, which sometimes needs a little bit of consultancy or a little bit of more research. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do on your own, but but even the implementation, you need some structure to that. How do you mm -hmm. do that? How do you how do you make sure you don't get initiative fatigue in your practice? I've had another new idea, another new system, and because um, mm -hmm. invariably that goes off the rails, and and you don't get value, whether that be from the the system or the new software or whatever it is you're trying to implement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you you keep the financial module to the to the end, and. And do the, the the vision thing parts up front? Yeah, it's um, 
Well, clients like that. Architects like this, this sort of big picture when you introduce them. And yes. when we, say to, we say to new clients on a consultancy basis, can you show us the drawings for your business? Mm-hmm. And we kind of look at us a bit askance and what do you mean the drawings for a business? Well, what does it look like when it's finished? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, we've, been, we've never really thought like that. But then, then the penny drops and they say, well, we do that every day for our clients. And we wouldn't just start laying a few bricks and hoping it all works out in a building. Um, but that's actually what we're doing in, in, in our practice. We're, we're going day by day, month to month, hoping it gets better. Whereas you need a plan. You need What does it look like in a year's time and two years' time? Will it work out exactly like that? Probably not. But at least everybody's aligned around that journey. And mm-hmm. business is like a journey. And if you're on a journey without a destination, that becomes very confusing for everybody. It, any, any idea is mm-hmm. relevant. Um, but once you get that destination clear, then you're looking at hotels in the one city, flights to the one city. And business is the same. Everything becomes contextualized around the vision. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how does the program work? Is it totally, okay, on, totally online or is it like in, yeah. in cohorts or in groups of people? There's a community that people can join? Yeah, we, we've done the program live um, and we have a pre-recorded version. Uh, and that's done, we, we recorded a group. So we've got a group of architects. They go through the program like everyone else. And we, we explain it's a bit like an empty chair. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you effectively buy an empty chair, you listen to the discussions, and typically the questions are the same, for every, whether it's live or pre-recorded, the, the questions come up the same. And what we've done in the new... Uh, business foundations program is we've taken the original program and for each module we've added in what we call a chapter extension uh, just covering the stuff that we've learned in the last five years so new models new frameworks and then probably the biggest change that we've made is we've introduced uh, an expert panel okay so we've taken all the as you said earlier it's a very small ecosystem of people who, who are helping architects in, on the mm-hmm. business side so you know Tyler's done a piece, Nikita Morell, uh, Amy Edwards, um, Ian Motley on fee proposal. So I think, I think we've got seven or eight experts who've all done a module in the programme. And that this programme will be something that people can go back and revisit. Uh, so you can do it once. It's eight modules, about an hour and a half for each module, but it's split into 10 Amazing. smaller parts. Uh, there's a long workbook that goes with the programme. It's a really comprehensive introduction to business. And it puts you in a position to say, can I do this on my own or do I need some consultancy help or do I need some specific expertise, maybe around finance or marketing? Copywriting um, is really important. And, and that, I think, using experts, it, it, and it almost gets architects thinking like how these specialists think. You, know, you pay for something. You pay for that confidence and perceived value, something that you don't have naturally yourself. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. So if people want to get in contact or find out more about the program, what's the best way for them to yeah, do that? So we, if we could put the link in the, in the, um, in the notes for the, this episode, uh, but you'll find that on the Archibus website uh, and the program is um, Business Foundations Program. Amazing, brilliant. Really, really excited uh, with this initiative, Ray, and um, always an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. Love what it is that you guys are doing uh, in the in the industry, and I know that the the quality of the material that people will be getting exposed to and with you guys is going to be extraordinary. So, I think it's perfect place for us to conclude our conversation. Thank you so much. No, it's great, and I appreciate your support. I think it's. Um... As we said earlier, I think this abundant thinking in the industry, there, there are very, not that many of us actually working in this space of helping architects. And the fact that we can work together, and I'm actually on your podcast, is, is a tribute to our openness and abundant thinking. So thanks very much. Thank you, Ray. And that's a wrap. And one more thing. If you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show, and we'd love to get your feedback. And we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. 
This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.